Well, hello there, Brookside. It is good to see you. Thanks very much for being here with us today. If you happen to be new to Brookside Services, please let us know that you are here. Just hop on over to connect.mybrookside.church and fill in our quick online connection card. It just takes a moment or two, and when you do that, we'll make a donation to COVID-19 relief work going on right here in our city. We are continuing our heavenly series today, so it's great that you're here for that. But just before we get to that, we're going to spend some time in worship. Well, hey there, Brookside. My name's Lucas, and I'm the worship director here at Brookside. And I'm really excited that you have joined us for church online today. I'm joined with my wife, Taryn. Hey, Taryn. Hey. How you doing today? Very good, thank you. <laughs> We're just so blessed uh, to have this opportunity to worship God together. Uh, I know we're, it's a virtual environment and it's a little different than maybe your church experience in the past. And we've just been trying to make the best of it over the past uh, many, many months. And you know what? I am blessed by you guys, by your encouragement and your support. And, uh, you know, this church, we just, we have such a firm foundation in Jesus Christ. And, uh, you know, this, this, um, this new series that we're in, it's a really fun series. We're thinking about heavenly things, about surprises, about how heaven is a real place that we can know about and, uh, and how God wants us to know about it. And that's really cool. Uh, one thing that I find really, really amazing, and, and that's a reason why we can worship God, is that we get to experience the glory of God in this life not only in heaven, not only like way, way later when, when we pass away and into the eternity, we, we get to worship God here and now together as a family because his glory is available to us. His life is available to us. So this morning or, or today, whenever you're watching this, would you worship with us?
was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future, my eyes are open. Cause when you call my name, Lord God, we thank you this morning. We thank you for your love. We thank you, God, that we are children of heaven. We thank you, God, that you are glorious and that we have access to your glory today. We bless you, Lord. We worship you. You are deserving of our praise. You are glorious. Lord, thank you that you call us daughters and sons, that we are your children. And that heaven truly is our home, our home. The place where we can be ourselves, who we were really meant to be. A place where our identity is known more perfectly than we can even imagine. I thank you, God, and I can't wait to come home. Thank you, God, for providing this for us. We worship you today. We worship you with our hearts. And we bless you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Lord God, we praise you this morning. We thank you. We thank you that we are children of the Most High God. We are children of yours. We bless you this. We bless you, God. We lift you high above everything else. And we just can't wait to see what you have in store for us today. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Hi, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. My name's Greg. I'm the lead pastor here at Brookside Baptist Church, and we are in a teaching series called Heavenly, looking at our future home and what it means for us today and what it's going to mean for us when we get there. It's uh, an amazing thing, and too often we don't spend enough time thinking about it. Well, it's been about 11 months now since our first lockdown with uh, the COVID pandemic when it first hit. And if you're like me, you're kind of looking back a little bit wistfully upon the days before COVID hit, back in the day when, when we didn't need masks and we didn't have to, we didn't even know the terminology of social distancing. That wasn't an issue for us. We could gather in the same room and we could shake hands and we, can, we, we, we could give each other a hug and all that kind of stuff. And we kind of look back wistfully on those days, kind of nostalgically looking back and kind of wishing we could go back to those days and just longing for, for the time when we can get just back to normal, you know, where, where, where it just feels more right, where it feels more normal, kind of the way it should be. This kind of experience that we all are quite familiar with right now, it, it, it's a bit of a taste of what we as a people have been experiencing since the day Adam and Eve first rebelled in the garden and were, and were kind of evicted out of the garden. Uh, C.S. Lewis, who was just a brilliant author and writer back uh, a generation or so ago, uh, he wrote this. He said this in, in a book called The Weight of Glory. He said, our lifelong nostalgia, our longing to be reunited with something in the universe from which we kind of feel cut off, to be on the inside of some door which we've always seemed to be on the outside is no mere neurotic fantasy, but the truest index of our real situation. Could it be that our, our, our drive in life to, to succeed and to have a, a great career and to amass money and, and, and you know, have, have the ideal family and, and, and the perfect house and all the right stuff to put in it and everything else, that could it be that all of these things, at least in some way, could, could be kind of an expression of this innate longing for something that we can never really find here? Something that, that, that doesn't exist this side of eternity. Something that's only going to be true, only going to be realized, only going to be satisfied in heaven, our true eternal home. And as super insightful book, uh, The Prodigal God. Uh, Timothy Keller writes about, and he actually uses the story, the, the parable of the prodigal son to help us come to terms with this sense of longing that we can have in our own hearts, in our own spirit. He says this, there seems to be a sense then in which we're all like the younger brother, the one who took off and said, I don't want to be anywhere near you. Give me my money. Let me go. Uh, we're all exiles, always longing for home. We're always traveling, but never arriving. The houses and families we actually inhabit are only inns along the way, but they aren't home. Home continues to evade us. And, and I'm, I'm going to read a little bit more of it just because Keller says it so much better than I can. So I, I just want to read a little bit more of what he said. He, he goes on to say, uh, in the beginning of the book of Genesis, we learn the reason why all people feel like exiles, like we're not really home. We're told that we were created to live in the garden of God. That was the world we were built for, a place in which there was no parting from love, no decay or disease. It was all these things because it was life before the face of God in his presence. There we were to adore and serve his infinite majesty and to know and enjoy and reflect his infinite beauty. 
That was our original home, the true country we were made for. We've been living since then in a world that no longer fits our deepest longings. Though we long for bodies that run and are not weary, we have become subject to disease and aging and death. Though we need love uh, that, that lasts, all of our relationships are subject to the inevitable entropy of time and they crumble in our hands. Even people who stay true to us die and leave us or we die and leave them. Though we long to make a difference in the world through our work, our exp we experience endless frustration. We never fully realize our hopes and dreams. We may work hard to recreate the home that we have lost, but, says the Bible, it only exists in the presence of the Heavenly Father from which we have fled if we have not returned to Him. Now, what Keller and, and Lewis are, are getting at and what the Bible reveals as we explore what the Bible has to say is that, uh, the, the, that this lack of a clear picture of heaven and, and the lack of a heart that is settled on heaven, it, it will inevitably lead to a life that is harder and more painful and more difficult than any of us want. And we find ourselves longing and yearning and hoping for what is good. But when our heart is fixed and our hope is fixed on heaven, the pains that we face, they seem more temporary. The, the losses less devastating. The disappointments less disappointing and less traumatic. The personal injustices that we may experience become less stinging. The worries that we have, the anxieties that we face can feel less overwhelming than when we are looking forward. When we're looking forward and we're excited, we're confident in the, the, the new life that is ahead of us, man, that, that, that just puts a spring in our step. That helps us walk through challenges of life, whether it's being stuck at home on our own in COVID or whether it's facing uh, the, a phone call from a doctor that has the news, kind of news that we don't wanna hear. Whatever it is, we can face it with greater hope, greater peace, greater anticipation because we know that our hand, lives are in God's hands. And a clear picture of heaven helps us to understand what's ahead for us. So what we want to do this morning or today, whether it's this morning, <laughs> whether it's this afternoon, the middle of the night, depending on when you're watching, what I want us to do for a couple of minutes right now is, is to ask this question, what will our heavenly home be like? What, what, what can we expect? What should we be looking forward to? When we look forward, what should be going through our minds, okay? Uh, and there's three things that I wanna invite you to consider. I wanna invite you to come along with me and investigate a little bit. Um, and, and here's the first thing that I want you to think about. Our heavenly home will be the home we've always longed for. It'll be the home we've always longed for. It will, when we, when we get to heaven, it's, it's not gonna be some weird, unfamiliar, uh, foreign place that we, that we don't feel comfortable in. We're, when we get there, we are going to experience um, just this sense of coming home that we could not have even imagined. We, we, we'll be home in the most awesome, wonderful, tangible ways. It'll be all the best of this world, all the best of what we've experienced here, but taken to the next level again. So much so that we'll be saying like, man, this is, this is home like I've never experienced it. I'm like home at last. Like this is awesome. Uh, what, will, what will our lives be like? Well, you will, you will be you. Like there's so, so often when I hear people talking about heaven, there's so many questions and so many wonderings like, will we remember anything from back here? Will we have bodies? Will we, will we just be floating around? Like all those kinds of things. And, and uh, there's simple answers to those things and they're found in, in the scriptures. We don't have to really wrestle very hard about it. Uh, but just to kind of give you a, a good sense here, you will be you, like you, you, you won't be something else. You'll be still who you are. You will still have your mind and you'll still have your emotions. You'll still have your, your will. They'll be perfected. They'll be, they'll, 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 they'll be taken up to, the, to a, a level that <laughs> is mind boggling. You won't be struggling with pain or sin or illness or anything like that anymore, uh, but you will still have your intellect and your mind, your emotions. Uh, you will have a physical 
body. Uh, we, we see this over and over in scripture that God is preparing a body for us. Uh, Jesus is a great example of somebody who had died, rose again, and is in a physical body, and, and he's now in heaven, right? In a physical body. Um, this is what he said in Luke 24, after he died, after he rose again, after he appeared, or while he's appearing to his disciples, and they're like, just their minds are blown. Here's, we saw you die horribly, and now you're standing with us. Or what's the deal? And he says, verse 39 of Luke 24, he says, look at my hands, look at my feet. You can see it's really me. Touch me and make sure I'm not a ghost because ghosts don't have bodies as you see that I do. Like Jesus is, is like, this is me. This is, I'm, I'm, I'm not something different. I'm not something weird. It's, I, I still am who I am. And part of who I am is my body. This is part of who I am, just like your body is part of who you are. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 kind of picks up on this idea as he talks about our kind of anticipation of Jesus' return and our being brought into heaven, this is how he describes it. Beginning at verse 52 of 1 Corinthians 15, he says, it'll happen in a moment. In the blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown, for when the trumpet sounds and those who have died will be raised to life forever. And we who are living will also be transformed for our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. Then, when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, this scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. What a beautiful picture that Paul's painting here. He's saying, right now, we've got bodies and they're not so good. They're falling apart. They need to be repaired every once in a while. And sometimes, they, well, they, actually, they all end up falling apart eventually. That's death, right? They, we, we, our bodies give up. We are going to be getting, we are going to be inheriting, we are going to be transformed into these new powerful, spiritual, eternal bodies that don't wear out, that don't get tired, that, that, that don't have pain. Like it, it, it's, it's amazing to think about what is ahead. But you know, you think about the typical lifespan of a person these days, first 20 years or so, it's pretty good. Everything, like everything's getting better. Everything's, you're getting stronger and you're getting, you're getting bigger and you're getting more agile and more able to do things and all that kind of stuff. But then what happens when you hit like 30 and 40, and I can tell you what happens when you hit 50 and beyond. It's like, okay, now we're, we're definitely on the other end of the side of the hill now. And things are starting to, it's, it's like you're trying to hold the brakes on that you don't go down too fast because you know, things are starting to wear out. Things are starting to ache. Things are starting to change. Um, imagine if that never happened. Imagine if you only got stronger and stronger. Imagine if you only got faster and faster. Imagine if, you, if your bodies were never wearing out and aching and, and sore and, and weary. Like, imagine what life would be like. Like, that would be amazing. That'd be awesome. That'd be awesome. And, what could, and you know, think about what our bodies are able to do. You look at what Jesus was able to do while he was here. He was like walking on water. Um, he, like the, the things that Jesus did, it was, it was incredible. Are we going to be able to do that? You may want to ask that question for our uh, Brookside Bander podcast. Maybe we can dig into that a little bit. Um, but, uh, you know, all of these possibilities for us, you know, are we going to experience cold the same way? Are we going to be able to go snowboarding uh, down Mount Everest with Jesus or something like that? Like the, all of these things are, are possibilities where we're, we're going to have physical bodies, physical bodies. And not only that, we're, we're going to still have our memory. Um, sometimes people will say, oh, we're, we're, we're not going to like, we're, we're not going to be able to remember anything about this life. But it's like, well, if I can't remember anything, in what way am I me? Like, we're pretty much the sum of our memories, right? It's, it's our ability to think and remember that makes us who we are. Uh, Randy Alcorn in his book, uh, called Heaven, theology textbook. Um, he tells the story of receiving a letter from a young woman who actually was in, in ministry. She was a church, 
she was involved in a in church ministry. She'd been following Jesus since she was really young. And she, in this letter, she said, you know what, when, when I was seven years old, a teacher at my Christian school told me that when I got to heaven, I wouldn't know anyone or anything from earth. I was terrified of dying, she said. I was never told anything different from anyone, from anyone else either. I was terrified of heaven. Then she says, you know, I've She's learned a bit more about what heaven's all about and the fact that that's not true. Um, And she said, you know what? Now I'm not afraid anymore. Heaven is going to be great. Uh, It's been really hard for me to advance in my Christian walk because of this fear of heaven, she said, looking back on her life. You don't know the weight that's been lifted off of me. Now I can't wait to get there. Like heaven's going to be awesome. And we're, we're, we're gonna, you're going to be you. I'm going to be me. If you are a follower of Jesus, you have this uh, incredible uh, f- future ahead, uh, personally, physically in heaven. Um, Revelation 21 uh, verses three and four says, God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things will be gone forever. Think of what life will be like like that. Think of what it would be like here and now if, if those things were gone forever. Like, wow. That's what we have awaiting us. And that's just be just touching the surface of, of what's ahead. There's so much more in the scriptures about the home that we have that we are that 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 we may not even realize we've been longing for. We're gonna be there. Uh, heaven will our heavenly home will be the home we've always longed for. And secondly, uh, heaven will be heaven and earth reunited, reunited, brought back together. Uh, we are not going, when, when, when we talk about our eternal home, it's not some, somewhere out there, this heavenly something floating somewhere, ethereal and, and disembodied. No, it's talking about heaven come back to earth. Like that's what we see over and over, especially in the latter part of uh, the Bible. Uh, and that's what, what, I, what I want us to take a, a little bit of time to think about uh, today. Heaven and earth reunited. In I think we mentioned it last week, First or Second Peter chapter three, uh, verse 10. Uh, talking about the day Jesus returns, it says the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. And then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire and the earth and everything else in it will be laid bare. The, 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 the idea of there is that everything will be exposed. It, it, it'll just be kind of all, everything unpeeled and unraveled and everything else. Uh, but the picture here is not that God is kind of kind of schmucking up heaven and throwing it in the garbage can, like he's giving up on heaven and earth somehow. Uh, but he's talking about renewal. He's talking about a rebirth of the planet. It's, it's, it, it's, he's making a new earth out of the old earth. That's kind of the idea here. And that's what Peter even picks up uh, in uh, chapter three, a couple of verses later where he says, uh, but we are looking forward to the new heavens and the new earth that he promised us, a world filled with God's righteousness. It's a world, it's a new world. And, and just the fact that he's using the term new earth instead of something totally different, uh, he's signifying this continuity from the old earth to the new earth. There's going to be, it's not gonna be like this totally foreign thing. It, it, it's gonna be the, 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 the same, but renewed. It's gonna be a new earth. There is continuity there. You know, I've, I've always thought about how uh, actually, when I was younger, I used to think how uh, I kind of felt like I was missing out because we had friends and people that we knew that would be traveling all over the world. Oh, we're going to Italy, and oh, we're taking a Mediterranean cruise, and we're going here and there. And and I remember thinking, yeah, it'd be kind of nice to go there and see those things. I don't think I'm ever going to get there. And uh, when I started realizing that when I get to heaven, it's going to be the new earth, I, it's going to be renewed, I am going to be able to get to Italy. I am, I, I, I've, I've been wanting for a while to do a motorcycle cr- ride down to the tip of South America, except 
I'd probably die. So don't want to do that right now because it's too dangerous and there's too many problems, but I'm planning on doing that when I get to the new earth. Like I, there's all kinds of things that I'm going to be able to do. I'm going to be able to see, I'm going to be able to experience just like you will uh, on this new earth that is coming. Uh, one of the most uh, probably amazing descriptions of the new earth that we find in the Bible is, uh, is found in the last two chapters of the last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 21, 22. If you haven't read those lately, you should sit down and read those this afternoon. If you're watching this and you keep watching this, you're gonna hear a good chunk of it because it's, it's so important for us to, to think about and dwell upon, but I'm gonna read chunks of it for us because what, what we're saying needs to be based on the scriptures, right? It needs to be based on what the Bible says. Um, so listen to this. This is Revelation chapter 21, talking about this kind of reunion of heaven and earth, okay? Listen to this. This is uh, John writing, and he's been, God is showing him what's to come. He says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the old earth, or for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared and the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven or coming down from God out of heaven, like a beautifully, like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And he goes on to describe this new Jerusalem, which is, which is described as the city in which God dwells. And uh, it ain't going to be anything like Jerusalem of today. Like uh, when, it, when he describes the size uh, uh, and the magnitude of this thing, it's, it's massive. It says it's 12,000 stadia in each direction. And that, 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 that's like 2,200 2, kilometers each way. So 2,200 2, kilometers wide, deep, high. Like that's, it's like, it's more than half the size of the moon, okay? So this thing's massive. Um, it's like, just in terms of the surface area square, like it's, I think it's like 2000 times as large as New York City metropolitan area, which is the, the largest city on the planet today. Um, it's, it's incredible, this, this thing's massive. Uh, and there's all kinds of scholarly discussion about you know, is this thing going to, uh, is it going to come down and somehow settle on the planet? Is it going to orbit? Who, who knows? We, we, we're not told that. And in fact, what's kind of interesting is John could have, could have jotted those things down, but that's not the important thing. He zeroes in on something even more important. We'll find out when we get there. Like there's a lot of things it's like, how's that gonna work? I'll let you know after it happens and we'll know for sure. Um, but this is, this is what matters. This is what he gets at here. Verse three, he says, I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He's gonna live with them. They will be his people. God himself will be with them. Wow, that, that's, that's amazing. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. That's that verse, we've already mentioned it before. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, look, look at this, like I'm making everything new. Like that, that, that's, that's this picture of heaven and earth being reconnected, reunited. They were cut off, uh, separated from each other at the fall when Adam and Eve sinned and God said, you know what, you need to scoot out of here. Um, <laughs> and uh, now they're being, it's being reconnected again. Further down in Revelation 21, down around 20, verse 22, uh, it says this. And again, describing this, city, this new Jerusalem. He says, I don't see any temple in the city for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city has no need for the sun or the moon, not saying that they have gone, although we don't really know for sure at this point. It's not saying that they have to be, but he said they don't need it. Why? For the glory of the Lord illuminates the city. The Lamb is its light. The nations will walk in its light and the kings of the world will enter the city in all their glory. Its gates will never be closed at the end of the day because there is no night there. 
All the nations will bring their glory and honor into the city. Nothing evil will be allowed to enter, nor anyone who practices shameful idolatry and dishonesty, but only those whose names are written in the book, the Lamb's book of life. Like, so here we see this, this picture of, of movement back and forth between uh, the, the city and the rest of the planet. Like there's, we're able to come and go uh, right into the very throne room of God and exploring around everything else. Like the, all of this is available to us. Uh, but all those that have chosen to rebel against God, that have not come through faith in Jesus Christ, uh, are excluded. They're not, they're, they're not allowed anywhere near this. Um, and that kind of reminds me of, of a statement. And, and, and again, I think it was Randy Alcorn who said it. And it, it's really sobering when you think about it. He said, the best of life on earth is, is just a glimpse of, of heaven. And the worst of life here on earth is a glimpse of hell. For Christians, this present life, he goes on to say, this present life is the closest that we are ever gonna come to hell. For a follower of Jesus, this is the worst it gets. But for an unbeliever, it's the closest thing they'll ever come to heaven. And it's like, wow, that's, when you, th when you think about incentive to reach people and share the good news of Jesus Christ, like this is one of them. Like that's, that, that's just mind blowing. Heaven uh, is that close and it's available to us and, and how tragic to miss, how tragic to miss heaven on earth. And, as we, and, and that's really what we have to look forward. What will our heavenly home be like? Our, home, uh, our heavenly home will be home like we've never experienced before. And it'll be heaven and earth reunited. And, and the final thing is this, that it will be heaven will be life in the presence of Jesus life in the presence of Jesus. We, we mentioned that already looking at uh, Revelation chapter 21. Uh, in chapter 22, uh, it shares a little bit more about that. It shares a little bit more about what that means for us. And just to paint the picture, let me share some of what it says. Verse one, Revelation 22. Then the angel showed me a river with the water of life as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the lamb. And it flowed down the center of the main street. On each side of the river grew a tree of life bearing 12 crops of fruit, the fresh crop each month. The leaves are used for medicine to heal the nations. So will there be cities in heaven? Yep. Will there be buildings in heaven? Yep. Will there be trees and brooks and streams and everything else? Yep, yep, yep. It's all going to be there. The tree of life is going to be there, which is kind of interesting. If you, if you follow the, the, the history of the tree of life, we, we first find it back in Genesis chapter 2. It's planted in the Garden of Eden, right? And it's there in the garden, beautiful. Uh, uh, but they were told, don't eat of that tree. You're not, you're not ready for that at this point. And uh, that didn't work. They, uh, they ate from, from the, the tree uh, of knowledge of good and evil. Get the right tree there. Uh, anyways, they are cut off from it. Genesis chapter three, uh, they're cut off from the, the tree of life uh, and somehow it is removed from uh, contact with the earth. It's now in heaven actually. We find out in Revelation chapter two that the tree of life is located in heaven, the garden of God. And now in verse uh, two of Revelation 22 and down in verse 14 as well, we find this tree of life returning to earth. It's, it's being brought back. Heaven and earth are being restored, reunited. Uh, so cool. It says there'll no longer be a curse on anything for the throne of God and of the lamb will be there and his descent and his servants will worship him. And they will see his face and his name will be written on their foreheads. Uh, it's like, you belong to me. And we're like, yeah, that's awesome. I want to be. Uh, there'll be no night there, no need for lamps or the sun for the Lord. God will shine on them and they will reign forever and ever. We're going to be doing meaningful, productive stuff, stuff that, that gets us out of bed in the morning and makes us want to go and serve and and bless and explore and learn and all that kind of stuff. It's all before us. And we're gonna be able to do that in the presence of God, being able to see his glory shining upon us, 
reflected in everything around us. And we'll be able to go and, and into his very presence. Like that's, uh, uh, that, that's mind blowing. It's incredible. Um, I remember reading uh, some of the uh, Chronicles of Narnia. Perhaps you've read some of, the, some of them yourself. I haven't read them all. Uh, I know that there are like seven books or something like that. You, maybe you've seen a couple of the movies. I think the first three books were put into movies the last little while. Um, but the final book is called The Last Battle. Uh, it's chronicling the end of the realm of Narnia. And it closes with the, 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 the starting, startling revelation that the closing of the old Narnia is actually the opportunity to enter into the new, more amazing Narnia that was planned and prepared for those that followed Aslan, uh, the, the lion, the, the king, who in this is the book represents kind of a, a Jesus figure. Um, and it's interesting, as, as, one, as they kind of step into this new land of Narnia, this is what one of them says. And I, I'm, I'm sure that what, what they say here is kind of similar to what I'm gonna be saying. And what, if you're following Jesus, what you're gonna be saying when you step foot into heaven. He said, I've come home at last. This is my real country. I belong here. This is the land I've been looking for all my life, though I never knew it till now. The reason why we love the old Narnia is that it sometimes looked a little like this. Come further out. Come further in. Further on, as they go further into, into heaven, um, they meet Aslan, the king. And it's just an incredible thing. You ought to read the book if you haven't read it before. Uh, but let me quote one little part of it, just the last little bit, and we're gonna wrap up with this. It says, as he, Aslan, was speaking to them, he no longer looked to them like a lion. But then the, the writer says this, but the things that began to happen after that were so great and beautiful, I cannot even write of them. And for us, this truly is the end of all the stories. And we can most truly say that they lived happily ever after. But for them, it was only the beginning of the real story. All their life in this world and all their adventures in Narnia had only been the cover and the title page. Now at last, they were beginning chapter one of the great story, which no one on earth has ever read, which goes on forever, in which every chapter is better than the one before. That's what is in store for us who know Jesus Christ. You know what, I was thinking about it, like this is Valentine's Day, right? Hopefully none of you guys forgot. Hopefully none of you ladies either. Valentine's Day can work both directions. Hope you have a wonderful Valentine's Day. It's a day when we try to find ways to express our love and our devotion to those we love right? We want to find ways to show them how much we care, whether that's getting them flowers or making a nice dinner or some chocolates or taking them somewhere, which is almost impossible to do right now with all the lockdown and everything else. But sometimes we'll like get them a, a really special gift, something that just shows them how much we care, how much we love them. Uh, and then, you know, there's all that excitement kind of preparing for the right moment to reveal it. And then there's the big reveal and they're like, oh, you're so wonderful and it's, it's great and everything else. Um, just watching their eyes light up and everything is, is, is beautiful. Um, what I was thinking about when I was thinking about this is that heaven is the ultimate Valentine's Day gift. Like Jesus loves you. He loves me that much that he's gone to prepare this place and it's gonna be amazing. It's gonna blow our socks off. And one day he's gonna you know, take the blindfold off and reveal it to us. And we're gonna be amazed at the most amazing Valentine's Day gift that's ever been given. But you gotta want it, you gotta ask for it, you gotta accept it. You know, if you know Jesus, I, I wanna encourage you to set your mind on things above, get thinking about heavenly things. Jesus says, that is what we ought to do. The apostle Paul urges us, take your mind off of all this stuff. It just gets you down, gets you worried, gets you distracted, everything else, or it tempts you in the wrong directions. Just get your eyes fixed on heaven. If you're exploring faith, keep, keep exploring. 
explore this. Explore what it means to know Jesus. Perhaps today will be the day when your exploring leads you to the place where you realize, you know what, I've explored enough. I may not have all the answers, but I've got enough. Enough answers, enough reasonable answers. It's time to make a decision. I'm gonna surrender my life to Jesus. I'm gonna ask Jesus, please forgive me. I recognize you are Lord, you are God. You, you are my creator, I'm accountable to you. I, I want to be forgiven, I want you to accept me. He'll, he'll take your life, he will pay the price for your sin. He will offer you a way into heaven. It's not by doing enough and now measuring up. It's like, it's a gift from him. Jesus died on the cross to pay the price so that you could receive this gift. So don't turn away from it. I encourage you, commit your life to following him. It's the most important thing you could do. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your love and faithfulness and your grace. And I thank you for giving us these these hints, uh, these uh, pictures of what is to come. Help us to recognize that there are far more than just little hints. There's so much here that we can discover about what heaven is gonna be like. And God, we pray that we would allow the truth of this to fill our lives and our hearts with anticipation and excitement. It's so easy to feel like this is just some something that's totally disconnected from our lives, but this is where we're going. Like this is, this is my future. This is the future of every person who knows you. Uh, God, we don't want to get there and say, oh, I should, have, I should have been more focused on this. I should have realized. So God, I pray for your grace. I pray for eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts that are quick to respond. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, Brookside. We're glad you're here right now, but we'd also love to connect together at other times too. It's our mission at Brookside to help develop fully engaged followers of Christ. Jesus didn't call us to just attend a church service. He called us to become more like him and to help others do that as well. And he called us to do that in community with others. You need people around you to help you become more like Jesus, people to do life together with. And life groups are a great way to do that, to join with others who are trying to become more like Jesus. If you're attending, just attending a service, you are missing out on what being part of Brookside is all about. Find your group of people to do life with, to become more like Jesus with. We can help you find those people. Just let us know that you want to explore a little bit more about life groups, find out a little more about what they're all about. And you can do that at mybrookside.church slash lifegroups. And now's a great time to do that because coming up soon, we've got an opportunity for you to explore what life groups are all about in a four week session. If you're not in a life group right now, do not miss out on this opportunity. It starts soon. So let us know that you're interested at mybrookside.church slash lifegroups. Do that today. On Tuesday morning at 10 a.m., remember we've got the banter live stream happening. Join Greg and Lucas as they talk through some thoughts and questions that came out of today's teaching content. Send in your own questions and be part of the conversation. You can check out that live stream on Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. or you can watch it on demand afterwards, or you can subscribe to the audio podcast version. The links to get there are all in the Brookside Brief. And hey, if you had any questions from today's content, send them in. You can do that by texting the number on the screen or emailing banter at mybrookside.church. And then be sure to check out the banter this week. Now also coming up on Tuesday, we have our monthly prayer gathering happening at 11 a.m. That happens over on Zoom, and you can join in to pray for the needs of your community. You'll find the link for that in the Brookside Brief. And remember that next Saturday night, we're having another board game night. We'll have at least a couple of game rooms happening on Zoom, and we'd, we'd love to pack the place out. So. We just want to come together and have a good time. That game night is Saturday, February 20 at 7 p.m. Just look for the link in the Brookside Brief. Through all of those things that we have going on, we are trying to stay connected to each other, trying to help each other out. It's all part of accomplishing our mission here at Brookside, which is to help develop fully engaged followers of Christ. That's what Jesus wants for all of us. And we want to thank you for giving financially to see more of that happen in our community. If you want to get on board with that and give toward pushing this mission forward, 
You can do that through e-transfer or pre-authorized debit, or even check if you need to. And all the instructions can be found at mybrookside.church giving. Thank you for giving so that we can continue to glorify God by doing our part to help move his mission forward. Hey, if you're new to Brookside, we'd love to know that you joined us here today. Please fill in our online connection card at connect.mybrookside.church. Just let us know a little bit about yourself, and when you do that, we'll make a donation to Respond Ottawa and their efforts to help meet needs across our city during the current COVID-19 crisis. Connect with us and help with crisis response in our city at the same time. It's that easy. Just go to connect.mybrookside.church. Thanks very much for doing that. And thanks again for being here with us today. If you're watching this during the Sunday morning premiere, the virtual lobby is open right now on Zoom. Stop by and see some friendly faces. You can get there by going to mybrookside.church slash lobby. We'd love to see you there. And if we don't, maybe we'll see you at one of our other online events coming up this week, like the prayer gathering, the Saturday game night, or maybe even during the banter live stream on Tuesday morning. Stay safe and stay connected.